Good morning. Will you please join me for the call to worship? People of God, we come to worship our God, who leads us into covenant and service, the God who gives us life, a God who gathers us as children and knows us each of our names, and a God who calls us for such a time as this to be the hands and the feet of Christ in our world. So come now, join in body and spirit as we raise our voices to our living God and as we rise as we're able to sing our first song. together this day, O oh Lord, as we come, let us be the gifts that you are to us. So as we come to worship this day, let us worship your name through Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Good morning. You may be seated. Welcome to worship here at Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church on this last Sunday of the month. Um, for those of you who are worshiping with us online, we welcome you. If you are worshiping with us online, we invite you to click on the QR code to check in your attendance and put your prayer or praise requests if needed, um, and just check out all the other good things that takes you to our website following that. For those of you who are in the sanctuary, if you're with us for the first time, we welcome you this morning and hope that you will find hopefully this to be your church home in the future. Um, a few announcements um, as we go into worship. Uh, one, um, excuse the, uh, if there's any errors in the multimedia, uh, we were having some issues with the uh, computers this week, so just uh, bear with us. I think everything is correct in there this morning, but if not, um, give some grace to the office boy. So, um, Next Sunday, we launch and start our um, contemporary style worship for the first uh, Sunday of the month. Um, it will be a wonderful service. We were working on it yesterday. Um, come with an open mind, with an open heart, and with grace, um, but I think it'll be a wonderful service. So, you changes that you know we're not used to but at the same time it'll all be uh, one collaborative uh, wonderful service next week but uh, make plans to do it bring a friend and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have some good worship next week following worship next Sunday we will have our all church picnic uh, weather permitting outside it seems it's going to be nice but um, you never know in Wisconsin but uh, join us afterwards for our picnic and uh, have some good fellowship and get to know some people that you may not know in the congregation Guess what? It's that time again. We are in the preparation of starting for our anniversary fundraiser in November. I know it's not even August yet, but um, never too early to start planning. But um, we will be doing our gala on November 18th, Saturday. We are back at the Sky Lounge at American Family Field, where we were a couple years ago when we celebrated our 50th. So make plans to be a part of that and to uh, celebrate our 52nd year here in Milwaukee. And that is all of the announcements that I have this morning. So with that, let us hear God's word. Our epistle lesson comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, taken from the Inclusive Bible. The Spirit, too, comes to help us in our weakness, for we don't know 
how to pray as we should. But the Spirit expresses our plea with groanings too deep for words. And God, who knows everything in our hearts, knows perfectly well what the Spirit is saying, because her intercessions of God's holy people are made according to the mind of God. We know that God makes everything work together for the good of those who love God and have been called according to God's purpose. They are the ones God chose long ago, predestined to share the image of the only begotten in order that Christ might be the firstborn of many. Those God predestined have likewise been called. Those God called have been also justified. And those God justified have, in turn, been glorified. What should be our response? Simply this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Since God did not spare the only begotten, but gave Christ up for the sake of us all, we may be certain, after such a gift, that God will freely give us everything. Who will bring a charge against God's chosen ones? Since God is the one who justifies, who has the power to condemn? Only Christ Jesus, who died, or rather, was raised, and sits at the right hand of God, who now intercedes for us. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Trouble? Calamity? Persecution? Hunger? Nakedness? Danger? Violence? As scripture says, for your sake, we're being killed all day long. We're looked upon as sheep to be slaughtered. Yet in all this, we are more than conquerors because God who has loved us. For I am certain that neither death nor life, nor neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, neither heights nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that comes to us in Christ Jesus, our Savior. May God bless the hearing of these sacred words.
you all please rise as you are able for the reading of today's gospel. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Luke's gospel, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, taken from the Inclusive Bible. An expert on the law stood up to put Jesus to the test and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit everlasting life? Jesus answered, What is written in the law? How do you read it? The expert on the law replied, You must love the Most High God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the expert on the law, seeking self-justification, pressed Jesus further. And just who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, There was a traveler going down from Jerusalem to Jericho who fell prey to robbers. A traveler was beaten, stripped naked, and left half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. The priest saw the traveler lying beside the road, but passed by on the other side. Likewise, there was a Levite who came the same way. This one, too, saw the afflicted traveler and passed on by the other side. But a Samaritan, who was taking the same road, came upon the traveler and, filled with compassion, approached the traveler and dressed the wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then the Samaritan put the wounded person on a donkey and went straight to an inn and took care of the injured one. The next day the Samaritan took out two silver pieces and gave them to the innkeeper with the request, Look after this person, and give them, and gave them to the innkeeper with the, and gave them to the innkeeper. If there is any further expense, I will pay you on the way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was the neighbor to the traveler who fell with the robbers? The answer came: the one who showed compassion. Jesus replied, "Then go and do the same." Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Come to prayer with me this morning. Loving God, as we're grateful that your hands and feet are in our lives once again, and even though that we may stumble from time to time, we know that you're right there to pick us up. But prepare us now, O oh God, as we open our hearts and open our minds to your spirit to be renewed and to be transformed by the words that are about to be spoken. Let it renew our minds, but it also let it renew us as we become more Christ-like in our ways. And now, God, I ask that you touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day, and the words that come from my mouth, along with all the meditations on each and every one of our hearts. Be they ever acceptable to you, in Christ we pray. Amen. 
I have to say that over these past five weeks out of the seven weeks, it seems that our scripture readings keep getting longer and longer, and it's not intentional. It's just that the content sometimes is more important than the shortness or the length of it. But this morning we start on number five in our sermon series of Summer 7. But it also means that we're starting to get close to the drawing of the end of what we call summer. Now I'm not so sure in Wisconsin because summer can go to October lately, the way we've been going on the last several years. But it's that kind of that feel that we're getting towards the end of the summer months where the kids will start going back to school and things will start changing and just the dynamics of the change of the seasons. But throughout this series, we have been digging through the topics that have been designed and hopefully to challenge us to maybe grow a little more deeper in our spiritual maturity. This series was designed to bring us closer with our relationship with Jesus Christ. And with today's possible message, there may be a little things that might be hard to digest or maybe not. It may step on some toes. Um, it may make your heart a little heavier or it may even convict you. But today's message is really going to be about one thing. And the premise of that is that our love for God would be best expressed when we show mercy and care for another human being in our lives. Let me maybe say it a different way. That your love for God or how much you love God would best be expressed when you show mercy to somebody else who may be in need. If you haven't already figured it out, God is the business of people. That's because people are God's thing. And that's because when God was creating everything, like the sun and the moon and the stars, making the earth by creating the land and sea, and after all of that was in place, God looked upon it and said, it is all good. And after these creations were in place, God decided to make us directly in the minute image of oneself. And once God created us, then God said, it's very good. God, like I said earlier, is in the people business because we are the culmination, the pinnacle, that high point of all of creation, all because God's heart is for people. Everything God does is centered around God's thoughts and hearts. All for the people of God that God has created. Meaning that every motive, every action of God was because of God's heart for the people who were treasured and loved. And if you're going to be in the people business, just as God is, then God is wanting us to be in the people business as well. This morning's gospel, we heard a certain story. A story that we've heard probably time and time again of the Good Samaritan. The parable, the parable seems to be a very well-known parable. And for those who aren't even followers, somehow draw to that parable. And if you stop and take a moment to realize that if you look at every well-known city throughout probably the nation, maybe the world, there's a Good Samaritan Hospital. Being that parable, being so well-known, there have probably been hundreds or thousands of sermons written on this parable, and I've preached on it a few times over the past. But the Good Samaritan is just what we see in other folks. Now, I took some time to look. And when I entered in Good Samaritan Sermon in Google, our friend, when I hit enter, like within a flash of light, like thousands upon thousands of sermons came up. Probably enough to make you blue in the face. But I was now thinking, what more can I say or preach on on the subject, seeing that all of these different sermon entries are there, and 
what would make a difference for each of us here in this congregation? Now, if you take a look at the, at the story at first glance, you'd probably come away with it telling us that it shows someone helping someone in need. But it's actually much more of that if you really dive into it. And one of the things in this parable, knowing that Luke wrote it, that Luke also included it in his gospel and not in any of the other books that he wrote. But I also think it was there to keep us thinking because it was meant to change the way we choose and to live our daily lives. This parable was actually written by, by Luke, but again, it came from Jesus, to change the way we make choices. And even today, hopefully when we leave worship, it will be part of the changes that we make in our lives as we move forward each day. So as we heard in our parable as it started this morning, that we have this man of the law, a Jewish lawyer, who is going to put Jesus to the test. And we've heard this question before in past sermons, where the lawyer now is asking Jesus to tell him where he can receive, or what he needs to do to receive eternal life. And in my opinion, I think the, the lawyer's question was there as he was trying to get to the bottom of a subject, which was salvation. Because his main question is, what do I need? What do I need to earn this eternal life? But we have to understand the question itself, actually, that it contradicts the core teachings of what Jesus teaches, because Jesus, I mean, what did Jesus teach us about salvation? What was Jesus' core teaching all about? Jesus taught us that salvation is the result of a relationship. And if we don't recall, if we go back to John 3.16, the famous John 3.16, where it says, For God so loved the world, which is about the people, right? Gave the only begotten Son, and whoever so believes in me. So ring a bell a little bit, hearing that again. It's Jesus again telling us to follow him, to believe in him, trust in him, to look at him and have that relationship with him. Because for those who believe that we won't perish through that life everlasting. Salvation is not one of those things that we are just somehow able to earn just by doing. We can't earn it through some kind of works of righteousness or the laws that we obey in such a way that we can achieve that. Salvation cannot be achieved just by doing it. It can't be accessed from anywhere or winning those efforts over. It's the eternal life that which is a gift. That's the theology of the gospel, which is the gift. And we inherit that from God. It's a gift that we inherit specifically from God. Now you have to think about that for a moment because an inheritance, how do you get an inheritance? Is it by doing something? No. An inheritance comes through a relationship. It's being in that right relationship and how you get your inheritance, that's how you inherit it, through that relationship. The lawyer asked Jesus, though, well, then what must I do? What do I do then? He was already asking the wrong question, if you want my opinion. And Jesus, of course, knows this because we know that Jesus is wise and smart, and we know that God, the universe, is part of that. And of course, Jesus does what he does so good, and he comes back, and instead of answering the, the question, he answers it with a question and redirects it with another question, something every good lawyer does. If you haven't noticed, any time that Jesus asks a question, he always answers it with a question right back, and we know this is his way of teaching us. 
So he's teaching, and when the lawyer keeps asking, what must I do to inherit this eternal life? Jesus comes back and asks him, well, what's the written law? Jesus is telling him, well, you're the expert in the law. You're the lawyer here. You ought to know the law. So why are you asking me this question? You should know the answer to this, Jesus is telling him. And Jesus is now asking him, how does he read it? I mean, you should be answering the question to me, Jesus says. So that's what he did. He went back actually into Deuteronomy to where we know the greatest commandment is listed. As we heard several weeks back, we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and our soul. Everything that we are and all of our strength and all of our minds so we can love God and then we need to love our neighbor just as we love ourselves. Sounding a little familiar from some of our previous sermon series of including all of that? You see, Jesus wanted the lawyer to struggle with trying to understand what eternal life was all about. And, but we're also talking about salvation it's that access to heaven. And what is heaven? Heaven is where God lives, basically. It's the eternal life with God. Having that access of life with God after being. Which is hopefully what we're all anticipating to receive once we receive the salvation. This is what Jesus was trying to make the lawyer think and understand along with the fact that he's not rooted through that fulfillment through all those laws. It's basically not trying to live out the laws. Salvation is directly linked through our relationship with Jesus and we have to think about it for a moment because our relationship with Jesus is all about following him and being Christ-like and learning from him at the same time. Basically, in essence, we're learning what it looks like to love God. God helps us to change and to know how to love people. Because, like we say at the top of the sermon, God is in the people business. So here, Jesus is like, come have a relationship with me. Because I can help you understand how to love God, how God will help you learn to love the people, and this is how it all works. So the entire story is about the love of God and loving our neighbor. So the answer that the lawyer gave Jesus, we know that Jesus actually loved because pretty much Jesus coming back to him saying, followed, coming back and telling the lawyer, so then do this and you'll live. But to love God of your neighbor but, and do this, at the same time, you need to do both. So at this point, the lawyer probably should have stopped there, but of course, you know, any good lawyer wants to keep pushing on. And he, of course, didn't stop. And the lawyer wanted some clarification and decides to ask one more question, as we heard. And he asked, so who's my neighbor? Meaning, I know who God is, but who is my neighbor? Because in Jewish culture, if you go back, only a fellow Jew was considered to be your neighbor. Jesus was trying to help him understand. <clears throat> See, Jews were very prejudiced back in that time, and if you weren't a Jew, then you weren't the neighbor. Because they didn't like the Gentiles. You know, they were the heathens. They didn't like the Samaritans because they were the half-breeds. But they were a prejudice. So if you weren't Jewish, then who was his neighbor? And Jesus knew well that we all should treat our brothers and neighbors equally. So as we heard in our gospel lesson this morning, that Jesus' huge reply was in this parable. That there was the traveler that was going from Jerusalem to Jericho who fell by robbers and was beaten and stripped naked and on and on and on. And as he comes to the priest, 
the priest just crosses over and goes on his way. And then there was the Levite, also a man of the church, also passing over Jesus and continuing on his way. And then there was a Samaritan. And when Jesus got to that, that sort of perked up the, the lawyer's ears because their, their connection with the Samaritans was not a good one. And here the Samaritan goes and cares and tends for this person who is about to die. Basically straps him on his donkey, takes him to the nearest hospital or wherever, and out of his own pocket takes money and gives it to the person to say, take care of this person until I can come back. So you have to look that this person basically was with this person overnight. And Jesus poses the question back to the lawyer then, which of these three, in your opinion, was the neighbor to the traveler who fell with the robbers? Now we have to take note that there's four people in this story. First of all, the victim, most likely probably a Jew, although never expressed explicitly that saying that he was a Jew. But if you put it into context, we're more than likely knowing that this person was a Jew. And he was on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. And we know that hearing the story that it wasn't always the best route to take. More times than not, people would get robbed or injured or something not good happening. And then the next person in the story is our priest. And now in Jewish culture, as we know, the priest was a very important person. They dressed differently. Everybody knew that. They knew that the priest had a closer connection with God, but also became the symbol of hope for people and usually a symbol of help. But unfortunately, this particular piece, priest passed by this poor guy and didn't really do one thing about it. And it says, it avoid, he avoided him and passed the poor guy and didn't do anything. And then there was the Levite, number three. And we know the Levites were a tribe of their own, that they served the temple, the church, and they also know that their life was serving God. But this person, too, doesn't help and stop the hurting man. And then finally, our number four person, our half-breed, our Samaritan. And again, the Jews and the Samaritans were prejudiced against each other. So for this fourth person who was coming up down the road, it somewhat seemed to be unlikely, but he saw the man lying there on the road and he felt something. And scripture calls it compassion. And as we heard in the lesson this morning, he went over and attended to the man's dying needs. Takes the man for care and did whatever he had to do. So Jesus now asked the lawyer, which one of these three are the, are the ones that you're going to call your neighbor? Which one had the real relationship with God? Which one of these guys had God's heart in them as they walked by the dying man. Which of these guys really loved God? I mean, we're talking about loving God with all of our heart and our mind and our soul here. Which one was your neighbor? And as we know from the story, and we've heard that so many times, it was the one who showed the mercy, in which time Jesus then gives the simple command this command which seemed to be the hardest command of them all. And a command that sometimes is most difficult for a lot of us even today. And all of us asking the day of which of like, Jesus says, go and do likewise. See, that's our call to action. That's our action if we love God 
then we need to prove it. We need to show God that we love people. We need to reach out to other human beings in the world. We need to reach out and express that love. If you really want to show God that you love God, we need to reach out and help other human beings and how we can be that holy of holies and showing God that we love and care about the next person as much as we care about ourselves. But you have to ask, why is that so hard to do in life? Why is it not something that comes easy to each of us? And I think the key is here is that we focus too much on the reward when we should be focusing more on the love. See, God's telling us not to take the mentality of the priest and the Levite and take the mindset, but take the mindset of the Samaritan because we can't show mercy unless we are leaving our comfort zone. We're so comfortable in our little cocoon, our little whatever, that it's like sometimes we have those blinders on to what's in front of us. So we need to start coming out of that comfort zone at times and dive into these unknowns, knowing that God will have our back no matter what, and also will guide us in the right direction. You see, we need to do more like the Samaritan where he interrupted the things in his life and had to show that compassion. I think so many times we're focused on our lives, and if we have that interruption, it's going to upset the apple cart, and it's like, okay, now what do I do? But we need to live out of mercy. And we can't do that unless we're willing to sacrifice things at times. And we need to remember that Jesus was the one who sacrificed for us with our salvation. At the same time, we're not weighing the sacrifice of the salvation. See, life is too short for all of us. And we know that we've been blessed with all of those resources that God has given us to be that blessing. See, as we go out into the world each and every day, we need to be willing to take the sacrifices and to continue to show that compassion and mercy for who our neighbors are. There are so many things down the road as we continue with life. And we're going to continue running in to those roadblocks each and every day. And we have to ask the question, are we willing to stop and upset the apple cart? and have some change in our lives and okay so we get out of our routine and we help somebody or are we going to focus just on ourselves and not love our neighbor as we're instructed to do so as we go out into the world this day we need to be willing to make those sacrifices rather than crossing the road and going on the other side and going on our way We need to be a good Samaritan. Blessings upon each and every one of you this morning. Amen. Good morning once again from the board and leadership here at Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. We are very pleased and happy that you are joining us for worship, especially those of you online as well. For those of you who are here in person, please don't forget to fill out your green card. And if you have any prayer requests or updates, please fill that out on the back so I can send out an updated prayer request on Wednesday. If you're worshiping online, you can go to our website and send an email with prayer requests and do a like or a comment as you're watching and let us know that you are with us. I really like the scripture from today, the Good Samaritan. It's how I run my life. I try and find compassion for people, try and help people, try and be there, offering up my resources and my time and my talent when they're in need. Sometimes it takes looking beyond them to see the need, too, because they don't always express it. Here at Milwaukee MCC, we do that for our congregants and for other people. We try and be there in the community to help people find God, worship God, to help people find community. If there are needs in our, our own family, we try and take care of it, we listen, we talk, we, we act. So, as you consider this community, as you consider this church, realize that we are trying to do everything we can 
to be there to help people to worship, to keep this building open, to function in the community and offer events that people can be a part of so that they feel drawn closer to God and drawn closer to us. So we thank you for your tithes and your offerings and how you support us. As we come to the table, we know each week that the table isn't ours, it's God's table and it's God's invitation for all of us to come. Will you pray with me? You shape us as your image, not so we would puff up with pride, but be mighty and humble to serve others. You have chosen us not because we are special, but that we might become hope to the world, bloated on despair. Searcher of our hearts, we would tell all of our wonders. You went and sold your life so you could buy us back from sin and death. You planted seeds of grace so that the lost, the little, the least, the last, and even we could make our homes in you. Bear of God's heart, we would tell all of our stories. You offer sighs from the depths of the very heart of God. We cannot shape words with peace in your hands. You step in the help of resolving the broken relationships. Heart of reconciliation, we would listen to your hopes. God and community, holy in one, we would tell you of the presence as we teach and as we repeat and say the prayer that Jesus has taught us by saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy dominion come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the dominion and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord of the kingdom be with you. And also with you. Children of God, offer your hearts to the one who calls us to serve the world. We embrace God with a loving heart. God's people sing praises forever and ever. We rejoice in the one who will not allow anything, not a thing, to keep us our hearts. Hearts overflow with praise, good and generous God. From you we come and all we need. You gather up all of the dreams that are shaped them into the gifts of creation. Bright blue skies that flow forever, kittens chasing butterflies in the backyard, children whose hopes now no end. The seeds of grace and peace are blossomed into the garden which we could be our home. But we choose to go out and follow the fields of sin and death to harvest the pearls of rebellion. Prophets came to tell us hearing the deep and hearing those sighs of our broken heart. But we thought their words would be fights of foolish fantasy. Your hearts set so that nothing might ever separate us from you again. You sent Jesus to bring your treasure of grace to us, a treasure that is old through the universe and new as the joy for each and every one of us. So as we join our voices with Jacob and Leah and Rachel and Laban and all your children forever singing our praises to you. <coughs> and upon these gifts you provided the fruit and the bread. Let us break the bread that we have and the cup that we bless to speak of the presence of Christ. By your spirit, unite us with the living Christ and all who follow Christ's way that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. We know that you are holy, God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus the Christ, your child, who comes among us and the faithful and the holy of the Creator, and we are blessed through Jesus. 
on the night that Christ was taken from us. As he took the bread at the end of the meal, he blessed it and broke it and said to them to take and to eat, for this is my body given for you. And each time that you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, taking the cup, blessing it, and as he was passing it to the disciples, saying to take and to drink, for this is the cup of the new covenant of my love and my life, poured out for you, but poured out for all of the people for the forgiveness of sin. And as often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For when we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we remember the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. Please pray with me. Heart of goodness and joy, send your spirit upon us now as she might eliven the bread so that fed we might spend the rest of our lives in service with your children. Immerse your spirit in the cup of mercy so that we may drink from it and that we may go forth and pour it out through the lifetime of compassion and caring for those who hunger and hope and healing. And when that moment comes, and we gather with all your people from every time and place to feast at the table of grace. We will lift our voices and praise to you, God and community, holy and one. Amen. to go out to the world this day and each and every day. Let us go out to the world through God's protection and love and tender mercies that are given to each and every one of us as we know that given to us through God the Creator, God the Savior, and God the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. I invite you to enjoy the post. -life.